Good evening. Um, my name is Rashad Kasava. I am the director of uh, Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's 37th Strom Lecture in Jewish Studies. This is actually longer than I have been a professor at the University of Washington, which I've been thinking that it's a long time. So it's really impressive record. This is a very special night for us. Uh, it gives us once again an opportunity to remember the generosity and friendship of Sam and Althea Strom, whose sport from very early on has turned our Jewish Studies program as, uh, into one of the best and most accomplished program of its kind in the country. So we're very proud of our uh, scholarship and of our students and of all the good things that the program is doing. Jewish Studies program is a part of the Jackson School of International Studies. And despite all the problems that the school is having because of budgets and other kinds of pressures, uh, the program actually has had a very uh, successful year. Um, one of our newly uh, appointed faculty members, Devin Nahr, is finishing a very successful first year in the school. And once again, we are, um, we've realized what a good choice we've made in hi hiring him, and he added a lot of strength into our program. And my colleague, Noam Pianco, is just about finishing his first year as the director of the program. So I'm very excited to have him in, in charge, and I'm really impressed by the good things that he is doing for the program. But of course, what makes this program very special and strong is the friendship and, and the uh, support of the community. And, and we are very indebted to you for your interest in continuing friendship. I think the turnout into this lecture this tonight is a very good proof of your continuing interest. And I'd like to thank you very much for coming. I'm going to invite my uh, colleague, Noam Pianco, to introduce our distinguished speaker. And I'm looking forward to a very interesting uh, lecture series this year. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome. It is a pleasure to see so many of you here tonight for our 37th uh, Strum Lecture. Not only have I not been here for 37 years, I'm uh, barely 37 myself. So this, uh, <laughs> this lecture really is, uh, for me, uh, constantly reminds me, well, either how old I am or how young the lecture series is, I'm not sure. But either way, it is quite a testament to how long this lecture has been going on. And for me personally, as a graduate student, and even towards the end of my undergraduate career, the way that I learned about um, the University of Washington and the Jewish Studies program here was by a series of books that I read in graduate school that all had this uh, Strum lecture attached to them. This lectureship has brought some of the, the leading scholars over the last 37 years. It's not only longevity that has made this program so unique. It is also the fact that so many tremendous books and scholarly achievements have come out of this program. And I know for me personally, it was my introduction to this program. And for many who know about our program throughout the country and throughout the year, uh, throughout the world, it really is the, uh, the Strum lectures that have um, helped to garner our national and international reputation as a leading Jewish studies program. As Rashat mentioned, uh, this, this, uh, this lecture is thanks to the uh, generosity of the Strum family. And I personally remember for my first years here seeing Althea Strum in the front row. And we miss her tremendously. And she gave so much. And it was always such a pleasure to see her smiling uh, and, uh, and, and really being engaged and, and laughing and sometimes even cutting some jokes while the lectures were going on. And, and I would sit next to her some years and always enjoyed what she would whisper in my ear during those lectures. So um, we really do miss Althea, and, um, and I never had a chance to meet Sam, but, but their family really has made this program what it is. I also want to thank, while we're here, as Rashad said, our program uh, exists and thrives thanks to the support of this community. And uh, I'm looking out and seeing so many of our supporters, and particularly the members of our advisory board who have done so much uh, this year and in years past to 
make sure that our program has what it needs to run and to thrive. So, so thank you. And of course, to uh, Rashad and the Jackson School, it really is a, a tremendous home for our Jewish Studies program in the Jackson School. And even though it is not a typical place for Jewish Studies to be housed, I can't remember, I can't, uh, I can't think of a better place for the, um, for the Jewish Studies program to be housed here at the, at the university. Would you mind just turning that off? Thank you. We have had a wonderfully successful year here at, uh, in the Jewish Studies program. And I'll tell you just briefly about it, and then I will introduce our speaker for the night. For those of you who um, know what our program does, I will um, just remind you that we reach over 1,000 students a year uh, through dozens of courses that explore the richness and diversity of Jewish cultures across time and space. We won, uh, at the beginning of the year, a very prestigious national grant to do innovative public programming. And with those funds, we put together four large uh, um, uh, talks around themes of Judaism and social justice that took place and were incredibly well attended and uh, raised some fascinating conversations. We paired national leaders in social justice, running uh, Jewish organizations committed to social justice with the University of Washington faculty. And it was quite a unique set of talks. We had folks, including Ruth Messenger and others, come. So that was another area of our success for the year. Um, I'm also very excited about our new digital initiative. We have launched, I think, what is really the first uh, blog site for a Jewish studies program around the country. It's called jewdub.org. I encourage you to uh, either, dur uh, hopefully after the lecture, but you know, if you uh, want to check it out now, you can. But it is um, a, a blog site that allows students and community members to talk about some of the issues that we think about in Jewish studies. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we have been able to make progress with that. And finally, as Rashad mentioned, we are thrilled that Devin Nahr is here. In addition to adding to our offerings in, in history broadly, he has also uh, brought his passion for teaching Sephardic studies to our Jewish studies program and to this community. And it's hard to imagine a better fit between one of the few people in the world who are experts in the language and culture of the Sephardic Jewish community and the third largest Sephardic Jewish community in the United States. And I'm just so excited uh, about the way in which uh, both our community uh, in, in, in uh, the Sephardic community and our Jewish studies community will work together to promote Sephardic studies here at the University of Washington. Onward to introducing our lecturer. For those of you who have spent any time in the Jewish community, whether in formal meetings or in informal conversations around your dinner table with your children, everybody seems to be asking themselves, what is going on with the young adults these days? What's happening with the youngsters? They seem like they do things in ways that are difficult to understand. What will happen to Judaism with a new generation that clearly has very different understanding of what Judaism is, what its boundaries look like. And these questions are the most pressing ones for many in the Jewish community. And they are ones that are quite difficult to answer. But we are very fortunate tonight to have probably the best person in the country and possibly even the world to give us some insights into what is going on today with a uh, younger uh, generation of Jews. Professor Stephen Cohen is a uh, sociologist by training, but really he is a public intellectual who takes his scholarship and he brings it to a wider audience. He is one of those scholars who appreciates the ways in which ideas can really make a difference, in which quantitative studies can illuminate what is going on and what should be going on. And it is for all those reasons that I'm thrilled that he is here tonight. He is a research professor of Jewish social policy at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, and director of the Berman Jewish Policy Archive at NYU Wagner. He has um, uh, uh, served as professor at the Melton Center for Jewish Education, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and Queens College, and has been a visiting professor at universities such as Brandeis, Yale, and the Jewish Theological Seminary. He has written a, a series, uh, written and co-written a number of books innumerable articles. It is difficult, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Stephen sent me his, uh, his CV and it's, you know, it's like you can't scroll down far enough to see all the things that he's written. But he is somebody who is passionate about what he does and continues to illuminate and, uh, and inspire and challenge 
both scholars and community leaders to think differently about the Jewish community, both today and tomorrow. And for me personally, I will say that uh, uh, Stephen has, has been both a um, at first sort of a you know a senior scholar and over the past few years really a friend. And one of the things that I most admire about Stephen Cohen is that he is somebody who really embraces intergenerational conversation. He is a scholar who is very firm in his beliefs, and for any of you who have argued with him, you will know that, but also very committed to listening to others, and especially committed to partnering with younger scholars and younger leaders to really hash out difficult questions. And he is ready to listen and to uh, shift his thinking, but also one of those people who has challenged me to rethink my own ideas and my own assumptions. And that conversation that he has taken up with many of the scholars in, in my generation, many of my friends and, and colleagues that I think has both contributed to his own scholarship but also to our scholarship as well. So I can't imagine a better person to try to bridge this conversation between generations of, uh, uh, or changing attitudes of Judaism in the United States than Stephen Cohen. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Stephen Cohen to, uh, uh, for his lecture, which is entitled Emerging uh, Jews in the Borderland, the Complicated, Fluid, and Episodic Nature of Jewish Identity for Some Today. Thank you, and please welcome Stephen Cohen. Thank you. That's very sweet. <clears throat> Every one of you should have as sweet and as, as uh, moving an introduction as I just had, so thank, no, thank you very much. I really very much appreciated your words. Um, <clears throat> just, there's an expression in Yiddish, which I can't do, but maybe Barbara Henry can, um, which says something like, uh, before I speak, I'd like to say a few words. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I am, <clears throat> I am duly impressed when I, 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 I looked at the, uh, the Jewish population study of Seattle, and I, I realized that by, by any reckoning, roughly one percent, if, if most of you are Jewish, which is a reasonable assumption, you don't have to be a sociologist to figure that out, but um, it looks like about one percent of the adult Jewish population of Seattle is now sitting in this room, and that's, and that's, and that's a remarkable achievement. In fact, there's so many people, there's some who are lined up outside, so those of you who are familiar with the expression, the overflow service will take place <laughs> shortly following this one. <laughs> Say your outside and get out. Anyway, um, that's, uh, th that's one, thing I want, one thing I wanted to say before we started. Um, and the, and the, other, the other thing I wanted to say is that everyone's mentioned the, the significance of 37 years. Well, it turns out I, I actually have a, a reason. I, I have been a professor 38 years. So um, I, I waited all this time to be invited to give the Strum lectures. And, um, and I'm very glad that in the first year that, that Noam Pianko has become chair of this department that I, I, I've uh, uh, earned this great privilege. And Noam, if we could arrange that 37 years from now, I can do the second lecture, I'd be very appreciative. It would be a miracle if I'm here. And, um, um, <clears throat> and uh, what, what I, the, 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 only, the only issue with Noam's wonderful introduction is that I'm, I'm not exactly talking about, I mean, I'll, I'll do a little bit, but I'm, I'm not exactly talking about the next generation. Uh, it, it, there is a very good talk that I can give on the next generation. It's not the one I prepared for tonight. Um, the, 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 the talk is, the, the title is correct. The I, I've recently become fascinated. This is the first time I'm speaking about this anywhere. I'm, I've become fascinated with, with a group who I'm calling the, the borderland Jews, Jews who, who dwell in the borderland of Jewish identity. They're, 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 they're within, with, within the circle somehow, but they're really at the fringes, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Um, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that long ago, it was in, in 2001, that we did a national Jewish population study, and I was, I was called in to try to fix it. Um, <laughs> Uh, did my best, um, and um, but I I am sing I am the singularly responsible for reducing the Jewish population of the United States by two two hundred thousand, um, and here's what here's what I did I I, I I I was called in to look at the study and to pass professional judgment on it, and um, at the at the time I was called in no, no one knew this we had we had four point two million Jews, 
And I said, that's ridiculous. Um, first of all, it's, it's wrong. But, but, uh, but second of all, I, I was, I'm an Israeli. I, was, I made Aliyah in 1992. I said, we, we have a lot of problems in Israel. We, we're, we're under attack. We don't want the American Jewish population to drop to 4.2 million. It's not good for us. So we're going to find more Jews. Um, <laughs> seriously. So, um, so I, I found a, a million and a quarter. Uh, it, um, and then I, I looked and I found 200,000 who were Christian. I said, no, they're not Jewish. And, and, I, and instead of reporting 5.4 million Jews, which happens, happened to be an underestimate but as, as many as I could find, uh, we reported 5.2 million Jews. Because I thought at the time, and I think I was, I think I was right then, but I'm, I'm saying I would be wrong today. I think I was right then to say that Jews who call, who call their religion Christianity are, are, were not seen by most Jews as Jewish. And therefore, they shouldn't be counted as Jewish. I, had a, had a, I, did, I did have a scientific reason, even with my interest in getting the, the maximal sustainable number of Jews in the population. Um, today, I would not make that judgment. And I'll, I'm going to try to explain why to you that I would make, in fact, I have, I have not made that judgment. I've, I've changed my judgment on later surveys that I've done. And I want, I want to explain to you the, the significance of that. But before I do so, um, I know in, in, a, in a little while, you're going to get a, have a chance to, um, to ask questions, but I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, uh, in, of course, in, uh, I have to apologize. I, I, need to, I need to conduct a public poll of people who regard themselves as Jewish in the room. So those of you who are not Jewish, just you know, take it easy. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to exclude you. I believe in diversity, inclusiveness. Um, some of my best friends are non-Jewish. Um, but I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a number of questions like we ask on our surveys. And I'm just curious to see the hands, and I'm going to make a point about this. First, first question, how, how many of you identify in the following three ways? And I'll, you'll, you, the, the three possible answers are Jewish, partially Jewish, or, or not Jewish. They're not Jews, you can, you can participate in this one. Uh, <laughs> Jewish. Hands down. Partially Jewish. One not Jewish? A few. Okay. Of those who identify as partially Jewish or, or, um, or Jewish, do, do you identify and they, they, your, your religion? Are you, is your religion Jewish, another religion, another religion? Okay. Those who said they were partially or Jewish, is, is your religion Jewish? Everyone's hands go. Okay, is your do you have another religion like Christianity? Anybody? One, two, right? You you say you're Jewish, but your religion's not Jewish, correct? One, two people. Uh, no religion. You're secular Jews. A few. Okay. Of those who are Jewish in any way, how many have you had? And there, there are three answers here: two Jewish parents, one Jewish parent, or no Jewish parents. Two Jewish parents. Damn. One Jewish parent. No Jewish parents. A few. Of those who, last one, of those who are Jewish, with no Jewish parents, who identify as Jewish in any way, how many of you, the, the two, two possibilities, did you go through a formal conversion to Judaism or didn't you? Formal conversion? Not formal conversion, but you're Jewish. No one. Okay. My point is that all those minority, strange answers that hardly anybody raised their hands to in this audience, out there, you know, out, out in, around in America, there are lots of people giving um, those other answers. Not most, significant numbers who are saying things like, I, I am partially Jewish. So it turns out to be a fairly common answer. And other answers like that. Um, we did a survey with uh, Sarah Benor, and we had, a, we had a simple question, we thought. Are you Jewish? You know, are you Jewish? And the answers are yes, no, and it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> we got like 5%. It's complicated. Like what, like, you know, all right? That, that, was, that was about four, four years ago, and I'm, this is be, I, where I'm beginning to understand it's complicated. It's not, it's not so easy. Uh, you remember the Meryl Streep in that movie? Or, right? <laughs> 
you know, it's complicated. You know, I, some of us don't have it all figured out yet. Um, and when you ask people their religion, you know, I assume people, you know, either you know, if they're Jewish, they either have the Jewish religion or none. You know, no religion. They're secular Jews. Fine. But but I, as again as I, as in 2001, I learned um, at that point, four percent of who would have been Jews by that survey, and it's a lot, number's a little larger today, uh, of people who are Jewish, when you ask their religion, they don't, have, they don't say no religion, they say that their religion is, is, you know, is Christian, and there's small numbers who, who mentioned a bunch of other religions which Jews have decided are okay. Um, uh, like Buddhism, that's okay. Or, you know, Hindu, okay, you know, like that, Scientology, I don't know what that is, but yeah, whatever, that's so, yeah. But, but I, you know, but, but like mamish non-Jewish religions, you know, genuinely non-Jewish religions, like, you know, Methodist or something like that, you know, th there are Jews who actually say, yeah, that's me. Um, I, and, and we're going to talk about how, how they got there. And then, and then the, the reason I asked that no Jewish parents and, and so forth, if you're, if you're, if you, if you don't, if, all right, traditional Judaism believes you're Jewish if your mother is Jewish. In 1983, the reform movement decided you're Jewish if you've had uh, acts of Jewish commitment and education through your life, and your father is Jewish. Um, the, the Jewish population, I know from having done surveys, regards what are called patrilineal Jews as Jewish. The vast majority of Jews, if you ask somebody, you know, there's this guy Goldberg, and uh, his mother's not Jewish, but he says he's Jewish. Is he Jewish? You know, yeah, of course, Jewish. Like, what, 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 why, why, why bother? If you ask you know, Orthodox people, a reform rabbi officially, and, um, and, and the vice president of the, sorry, sorry, a, a conservative rabbi officially, and the, 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 the principal of Salma Shechter School, they'll say Goldberg isn't Jewish. Everybody else says he's Jewish. Uh, people who worry about the children marrying non-Jews would say, thank God, Goldberg's fine. We'll bring him in, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> not, a, not a problem. That guy's, that guy's Jewish. Doesn't matter if his mother's name is Ferrillo or Riley or whatever. <laughs> but what about no, all right, so, so we're American Jews. We're all agreed, you know, one Jewish parent, either way, Jewish. What about no Jewish parents? Well, then there's a, there's a way. You, you become Jewish. You, you become Jewish by uh, converting. You go to a rabbi. You, used to, you know, take a few lessons, and da -da -da, a, year, a year later, you, you, you get a little, a little test. You do a dunk. You do some, some other things, too, whatever. <laughs> things happen. You're, Jew, you're converted. You have a, you have a relig religious conversion. Well, it turns out, from recent data that I'm looking at, that there are, there are converts. There are three times as many people who have no Jewish parents who say that they're Jewish who did not go through formal religious conversion. The, the, the informal door is now, is now open. I, I, I call these people Jews by personal choice. Um, they are just assuming that they're, that they're Jewish. Um, so we have, in, in effect, um, Three types of borderland, what I call borderland Jews. They're somewhere in that, they're, they're in, in this non conventional category that, for all, and they, they function as Jews. Um, um, a, a small number, I didn't mention them, are non identifying Jews. When you ask them, are you Jewish? They say no. And then they're, both their parents are Jewish, they have not adopted another religion, they, they haven't since gone over to the other side. Um, there, it's around 1% of the population. I call them non-identifying non Jews. There's stories told about one of these guys who was named Shapiro, who was being um, hectored by the UJA to make a contribution. And you know, he, he kept hanging up on the person, and the person said, but your name is Shapiro. He goes, yeah. Well, that means your father's name was Shapiro. He goes, right. Well, y y your, your father must have been Jewish. No, we're not Jewish. I'm, I'm, I'm not Jewish. I'm telling you I'm not Jewish. Go away. Don't bother me. And then the, they say, yeah, but what about your father? And my father, Oliver Sholem, he wasn't Jewish either. <laughs> <And> my, 
<laughs> my, my father got, you know, on, on, on him maybe, the C, it's, a, it's the Hebrew word for, but I'm not talking about those types of people, but there are, there are people like, like Shapiro in the population. They exist, about one in 100. There's as many of them in the population as you are of Seattle, right? So they exist. We also have these Jews by personal choice who are Jewish with no, with no uh, Jewish parentage and never went through a formal conversion, many more of them than, than formal converts. And there are people, a little bit of overlap with converts and others, um, who, who, have a, who are Jewish and have a religion other than, um, uh, other than Judaism. That they have a religion, not, not, not and, a few and Judaism, Judaism and Christianity, but a lot of them just are, are Christians who are, who are Jewish. By the way, those of you who have any familiar, familiarity with um, FSU Jews, Jews from the former, former Soviet Union, you should know they regard religion as philosophy. Like, and, 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 and one, one colleague of ours, Svi Gittleman, says that they actually, they feel, um, they feel that they have, that, that a, a, a Judaism practicing Russian Jew will feel greater uh, uh, social closeness with a Christian practicing Russian Jew than with a Moroccan Jew. They, their, their, their definition of being Jewish is heavily ethnic and, um, and a, a, you know, a, an Orthodox Moroccan Jew makes, it makes no sense to them, but a, a, a Christian Russian Jew makes a, makes a lot of sense to them because your religion is just kind of a, it's like an epiphenomenon. Just, it rides above who you are. It's not, not, important, not important to your identity. So, uh, so I'm looking at these numbers and they're adding up. There's 10, 15%, I mean, some number of the population that is in these unconventional categories today that didn't exist before. They just weren't there. Like, look at you. Look, look, at, your, look at your answers. Um, your, you this very crowd exemplifies the standard definition of who's Jewish. You're, you're Jewish and without equivocation. You say you're Jewish without equivocation. You don't say partially. Um, you say your religion is Jewish. And a few of you who had non-Jewish parents became Jewish by way of formal conversion. And hardly any of you have, uh, have non-Jewish re religion in your, uh, as, as, the, as your affiliation. So you, this crowd, typifies the conventional pattern of Jewish life. And I'm telling you, on our surveys, we're picking up all these, all, all these other people. Um, obviously, none of the, they don't want to show up here because they were embarrassed with my, my talk. But uh, I assure you, they really do exist. Um, so I want to ask uh, three questions uh, of, of this phenomenon. Um, uh, and, and actually, to, to redeem myself in Noam's introduction, uh, all of these trends are becoming more frequent among younger Jews. So here, this is one of the aspects of, of being a younger Jew today, that either you're in this category, or as a younger Jew, you have f many more friends and family mem members who are in this category. The Jewish life is changing for you because of all these people with these unconventional categories. Now, the first question is, why? W why do we have so many and increasing numbers of what I call borderland Jews today? Uh, second, wh what are the implications for Jews, Judaism, and the Jewish people? And third, what are the implications for practice and policy for individuals and the community? You know, in a sense, what, what should we do about this if we do, should do anything? Um, so the first question uh, about why are there so many borderland Jews today, I want to turn to three um, areas for answers. Uh, one is um, to look at uh, American religion and ethnicity today. A second is to look back to Jewish history, and these are, these are short answers. And a third is to look at contemporary American Jewry. And all three uh, tell me why there are so many more borderland Jews today. First of all, let's talk about American, um, American religion. Um, one of the master, th master themes of, America, of, a, of, of research on American religion today is that identities, both religious and ethnic, are far more fluid than they used to be. Um, we see more people switching their religious identities uh, over their life course. And actually, they, we also have evidence that they switch their ethnic identities 
over their life course. And, 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 and the census over time picks up different definitions of who I am, Hispanic, Cuban, uh, uh, Asian American, Chinese. People are changing those, those identities or even reaching back, way back into the past to reclaim a, a, a minority ethnic identity. I mean, in, in all seriousness, there was a, in 2008, when President Obama, may he live and be well and be reelected in 2012, <laughs> um, uh, um, I, I know where I am. <laughs> Seattle, Jewish, you know. <laughs> This, over there, the, the last row is Republican. <laughs> Have mercy on, upon him and his soul. Um, um, there, was a, there was even, a, there was even a, 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 a campaign song that was on, on YouTube. Um, There's no one as Irish as Barack Obama. And there was a, it turns out that I, uh, Barack Obama is 1 16th Irish, that his great great grand something or other was, was in. Was, was born in Ireland. Um, so even Barack Obama is, is partially Irish. And people actually do this. So they select and switch their ethnic identities. They select and switch their religious identities much more than in the past. Along with that is that there's a lot more um, interreligious and interethnic marriage than ever before. And not only that, but there's also, is, is, as you know, attitudes follow uh, behavior. Um, not only has in, intergroup marriage increased, but uh, attitudes towards intergroup marriage have um, become far more accepting. Um, um, as last year's Straum uh, uh, scholar, uh, Jonathan Sauner, once said, in, in 1970, Jews, Protestants, Catholics could agree on one thing, marry within your own faith. And by 2010, whatever, whatever it was, you know, recently, uh, uh, only some Jews still believe that. Um, Catholics, Protestants, and, and most Jews actually said that that's not, just, just, not, just not an issue. So, so there's um, a lot more fluidity of, of identities. Uh, secondly, identities are more malleable. So we have fluidity and we have malleability. Malleable means you can kind of make it up. You, you, know, you can invent you know, what, what you are. Um, and it happens all, all over. There's a, there's a book by Mary Waters called Ethnic Options. I think you hear the title, Ethnic Options. You know, ethnicity is an option. And, and she, she writes about people, she writes about people who she interviews who are, uh, who are uh, Italian in December and Irish in June. <laughs> no, it's like, that's what I'm talking about, change. But, and then she asks people, you know, like, do you do something to, like, express your ethnicity. And I remember reading one, one passage where she said, someone said, you know, you know I'm, I'm Czech, and I, I eat this Czech food. Well, I'm not sure if it's really Czech, but by me it's Czech food. Because it, it's, it's food, it's a, it's a dish that my mother would make, and my mother was Czech. So I'm, I, I declare it Czech food. And, and, so, and so it is. Um, and then, so people, invent what the, the meaning of their ethnicity or religion are. You guys are laughing. And I remember I, I made that joke before about Obama and, and, and liberalism and Jews and all that stuff. And you think that liberalism is part and parcel to being Jewish. Not all of you, I know. But, um, but, but you should know that only 20th century and now early 21st century American Jews, are the, they're, they're, the, they're the only Jews who identify political liberalism with Judaism. No one else does. Even socialist Jews in Israel know that Judaism is conservative and nationalist and anti-democratic. Like we, we, we have to overcome Judaism to be democratic. Um, uh, Can Canadian Jews don't believe this. South African Jews don't believe this. 19th century American Jews didn't believe it. 20th century American Jews made up the idea that liberalism is part of Judaism. Uh, and, so, and so we believe it, and then we, and we, we, endow, uh, we endow liberalism with Judaism, Judaism with liberalism, but it's made up, and, we, and, we, and, and so we do this as well. I'm saying that society, religious and, and ethnic groups in society are making up what it means to be ethnic or, or religious. And the, 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 the third characteristic, aside from fluidity and malleability, is what I call hybridity, not I, but uh, many scholars, and that is the easy coexistence of multiple religious and ethnic identities that were once mutually exclusive. And people can be this and that. I mean, you know, you want to be 
a Yankee fan and a Democrat? I mean, he goes, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's, that, that's fine. Cool. You know, and a New Yorker. Oh, okay. No problem. Do you say you want to be um, Hindu and Jewish? Mm, I guess. And I'm saying, but you can be Christian and Jewish. And people actually, uh, actually say that. And actually, let me give you some quotes from s some recent studies I've done. And you'll hear um, uh, about fluidity. A person who, says, who used to be Jewish says, the rest of my family is Jewish. I just chose another religion. I, he stopped. He just left. Um, so why are you Jewish? She answers, uh, because my husband is Jewish. And besides, I like Jewish religion and culture. Like, the, this is one of those people who has no Jewish background and has become Jewish because she likes it and because she's married to her Jewish husband. Um, uh, another woman relates that she was Jewish because her ex-husband was Jewish and the kids are Jewish. That's why she's Jewish, right? Uh, we have another one who says in, in our survey, um, why are you Jewish? My grandchildren are Jewish, so I'm Jewish. But the, you know what that means? She's not Jewish. Her daughter is not Jewish. Her daughter married a Jewish guy. They're raising Jewish, they're raising Jewish, with her, you know, Jewish kids, which is like her, her grandchildren. That makes the grandmother Jewish, right? <laughs> and she functions, she functions, she has Jewish friends, she goes to Passover Seder, she, she considers herself Jewish, and she's also Roman Catholic, right? So this is, this is, one of the, this is what's in the population. This is what we have out there. Um, ah, just a couple more. Um, and then it's about the moving back and forth. I was born Jewish and years ago converted to Christianity and then practiced Judaism again for my children. <laughs> right? In and out, back and forth. Uh, uh, last, uh, last, uh, last couple, one, one person said, I am two, you ask, well, what's your religion? I'm two religions, is her answer. And another one um, said, we ask, what, what's her religion? She goes, well, <clears throat> when I'm with my father, I'm Jewish. When I'm with my mother, I'm Catholic. <laughs> All right? So, you have a, so th this is the world in which we now live. It is, it, it is, it is a world, I, I, I know, you know I, we, all, we find these things humorous, but it's the reality that, that is now confronting American Jewry and American Judaism that, that's different. The last big trend in American religion, um, aside from fluidity, malleability, and hybridity, is what I, I just because I, I wanted to rhyme, I called it disparity. But what, what I mean is that, that both poles, the, uh, I don't mean Poland, I mean you know, edges of the, of the, of the spectrum, the, the fervent religious groups in America and the nuns, n not the black and white, but the N-O-N-E-S, that both groups are raw, have, 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 you know, have risen. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the, fervent, the fervent types actually had a very good couple of decades, 1980s, 1990s, the evangelicals and the uh, fundamentalists um, and the, kind of the, the stricter churches did very well in America, and then they've kind of leveled off. That it hasn't been so good for them. But they, they, did, they did pretty well for many, many years. And in the last 20 years, there's been a rise in the, the, the nuns, people who say in variety of ways, I have no religion, I don't go to services, I don't believe, uh, all those, all the, all, all the no religion people are, are, are growing. And again, uh, obviously for Jews, the, uh, both, we see both of these, these trends. In, in a different context, I would tell you about the huge, well, actually I'll mention later, but the, the huge rise in orthodoxy. But the other part of it, the, the rise of these fluid, malleable, hybrid identities, uh, is, is also a reflection of what's going on in America. So that's, that's America. Uh, a, a, quick, a, a quick glance into Jewish history. Um, I don't know what you guys teach in Seattle, but when I took Jewish history at Columbia, there was a basic course called uh, Enlightenment and Emancipation. Like, that's, that, that's, that's the, big, the, 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 the big encounter with modernity for Jews is called Enlightenment and, and Emancipation. Enlightenment affects what you think, emancipation affects your social structure. Enlightenment meant the expansion of voluntarism and autonomy, rationality. People can, can, can pick and choose how to define their religious identities. And emancipation means that the boundaries that separated Jews from non-Jews come down. And, and, the, and the whole history of Jewish life since 1750 
has been, an, uh, has been trying to figure out how do we uh, encounter, uh, how do we grapple with enlightenment, a, a changing world, a turning worldview, and emancipation, which is like the enlightenment is, is true of, of all people, and emancipation is a, is a peculiar Jewish condition in that Jews were one of the few uh, ethnic religious minorities in Europe who were a, who were a separate legal and political class, uh, and Jews experienced the end of that separation. Um, and so those, those two trends in Jewish history are playing out today. And lastly, uh, American Jewry. Specific to American Jewry, what's, what's, what's been going on in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Um, one, one factor has been the far greater acceptance of Jews by the larger society, which makes all this fluidity possible. Uh, when I was in grad school in the early 70s, I remember I was studying um, social distance surveys, you know, how, how, how distant do you feel from different groups, that were conducted in the, late, in the early 60s. And on those surveys, as I recall, um, Jews were the lowest ranking white ethnic group. Jews beat blacks and Puerto Ricans, but lost out to Portuguese, Italians, and then, you know, on upward. Um, uh, at the top of the scale were Episcopalians, and Jews were at the, at the bottom of the, of the white scale. Uh, Robert Putnam in, uh, and Campbell in Amazing in American Grace do a study, and they, and they have a... Um, have a, a, a standard social scientific instrument called a feeling thermometer. And they ask people, how do you feel about these people? You know, you, zero, 50, 100, whatever. And, and they have all these groups judging all these other groups. Um, Jews wind up at the top. Jews who, who in the early 60s had been at the bottom of the white ethnic list, now in, <clears throat> in 2009 or so, emerge at the very, very top of, uh, of the American list they are the most admired group in America. Now, I see some of you shaking your head, no. <laughs> I, to you, I say, I remind you of the insightful words of Israel's foreign minister, Abba Iban, uh, who once said that Jews are the one people who can't take yes for an answer. <laughs> so, uh, so <clears throat> I... I know that you've experienced deep anti-Semitism that has really, really uh, tremendously limited your life chances. It's prevented you from achieving all that you want in life. Um, you, you've been shut out of the upper middle class. You're forced to live in certain neighborhoods that you didn't want to live in. Uh, your kids couldn't go, to, couldn't go to certain schools. But I assure you that uh, actually uh, Jews are, are, are beloved in American society. They're highly admired, as, as Putin said, um, we are, we are richer, smarter, and funnier than other people, and that's why we're admired. And, and, and basi basically, on two of those, he has clear evidence that Jews actually do have extraordinarily high um, uh, economic status on average, although there are thousands of poor Jews, and Jews have, uh, uh, have the highest educational status of any religious group in America, except for the Hindus. Um, although there are a lot of stupid Jews. So it's not, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to you about averages and not about the entire population, but really, and in terms of funny, there's John Stewart and me. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I assure you Jews are widely admired. There's a reason why half of American Jews, when they marry, marry non-Jews. Half the story is that Jews fall in love with non-Jews. The other half of the story is that non-Jews fall in love with Jews. Um, 75 to 80 percent of, of younger American Jews have had a romantic relationship with a non-Jew. This, um, this is a phenomenon which my grandparents would have no understanding of. Like, you know, you know Bubby, did you ever date? She wouldn't, understand, she wouldn't know, you know, non-Jew. She couldn't, she couldn't put any of this stuff together. Uh, <coughs> um, but that is the, the common experience of young Jews today, is that they love and are, and are loved by non-Jews. And that is, a, uh, that is a major shift in American society. 
that also makes for this fluidity I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> and then it immediately leads to intergroup marriage and friendship. Uh, intergroup uh, marriage, in turn, generates a lot of these people that have multiple religious identities, who have the ability to move in and move out of the population, uh, who, who can define being Jewish in any kind of uh, which way they, they wish. Um, the, other, the other factor that we know about uh, uh, the intermarried and the children of the intermarried is that they score lower on all measures of, that we have of Jewish involvement and engagement, however you measure such things, but they're, they are especially uh, low scoring on the, the ethnic measures rather than the religious measures. In other words, uh, the gaps between inmarried and intermarried on, let's say, Passover Seder are not as severe as, as the, the gaps on uh, having other Jewish friends or living in a Jewish neighborhood. So the, the ethnic measures are, are wider, and the, and the ethnic measures with the largest gaps have to do with Israel. Um, the, the, the is, on, the, on Israel measures, the intermarried and the, in, and the inmarried, or the children of the intermarried and the children of the intermarried have the, 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 widest, uh, the widest differences. Um, and as a result, um, in, intermarriage is creating the types of people who, who are living in this Jewish borderland, but they're also, th these people who are in the borderland, and this is part of the, part of the policy challenge to American Jewry, are, um, are bringing a way of being Jewish which, um, uh, let's just say, departs from the prevailing or inherited notions of what it means to be Jewish. And that, now I want to get to the last, uh, last and the next, you know, essentially the last uh, area, which is, well, what does, this, what does this all mean and what do you do about it? Um, um, so just, just to give you a, a, um, a quick kind of sociodemographic sketch of American Jewry, uh, all Jews can be divided into three groups. The Orthodox, the intermarried, and the inmarried non-Orthodox. Uh, in non uh, that's a very crude division that actually, if you're, if you're marketing, would be a pretty, a pretty good market segmentation because you have really three different Jewish markets out there. The Orthodox have been expanding enormously in size over the last 10 or 15 years uh, for all kinds of reasons, but they, they really have very high birth rates and they retain uh, their young people as Orthodox, uh, much more, more, more so than the past, especially if they're Haredi Orthodox rather than modern Orthodox, but the modern Orthodox are also clearly in the areas of uh, positive population growth. The, um, the intermarried population, as I indicated, is growing in size, um, but the intermarriage rate has not been going up. It's been, it's been holding, holding, holding steady at around 47 to 50%, um, but it, it's generating lots of people who in turn either are not Jewish or who marry non-Jews, a few of them marry Jews, um, and who form, part, form this borderland. Between these two groups are, is this group which is largely in married, not entirely, largely non-Orthodox, and that group is, I can call it the mainstream, that group has been shrinking in, in, uh, in absolute and in relative number. And every institution of that group has been uh, declining in power and size. Think about the following. I'll just go through a quick list. Reform Jews, conservative Jews, Federation, Hadassah, B'nai B'rith, National Council of Jewish Women, supporters of Israel outside of orthodoxy. Pick any, 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 any of these measures, all of, all of those phenomena are having uh, shrinking membership and and or aging membership. It's what you hear about every single one of them. There was, I just read today's paper, today's JTA, that the average age of B'nai B'rith is now deceased, which is really quite, <laughs> really quite advanced. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I can make that joke and not have to worry about retribution. About 20 years ago, I'd have to worry about it. Somebody, some B'nai B'rith person would be like, you know, write Noam Pianko four emails or something. Well, before there were emails, he would write a letter. I don't know. Uh, but I don't have to worry now anymore. <laughs> 
uh, who, you know, but um, I, I, I don't, by the way, I don't, I'm not happy with the decline of Benny Brith. I, not that I'm, I've ever been a Benny Brith member, but, um, uh, but I, 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 I'm pro institutions and organizations and, and I'm, I'm not happy that B'nai B'rith and Hadassah and all the rest are, are in decline. Um, so it, it's in this background that we see the expansion of these borderland Jews. And wh what do they mean? What's, what's, what's the implication? Um, one, of the, one, th one effect of the borderland Jews is that they uh, further, I believe, the alienation uh, of orthodoxy from the rest of American Jewry. Um, the, I mean, it's, the, the Orthodox had their own reasons for becoming more sectarian, and it's been for 200 years, Orthodoxy has been, uh, not, not, not that long, yeah, roughly, has been uh, uh, negotiating its relationship with, uh, with uh, Klal Israel, the, the rest of, of Jewry, but certainly the, the high rates of intermarriage and the uh, and the appearance of people whose Jewish credentials, in their terms, are not all, all that genuine, um, uh, has, has supported those forces in orthodoxy which have said, you know what? God will take care of those Jews. We just can't, we can't be part of that population. Our children can't take the risk of marrying those children. We don't know how our grandchildren are gonna, are gonna turn out and they have become more and more segregated from the rest of Jewry, in part because of the phenomena that the borderland Jews re represent. Um, second, the growth of the borderland Jews means that there are fewer Jews who are able or interested in joining conservative reform synagogues, uh, paying for federation, and B'nai B'rith, Hadassah, all that stuff. So the, 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 the mainstream uh, is losing potential uh, members. Uh, in addition, to, to the actual population I issues, um, there's a culture which, I'm not gonna put off on the borderland Jews, but there's a, a culture of disaffiliation and deinstitutionalization de in general, but this is, this is part of it. Um, in general, borderland Jews are part of the phenomenon of, of weaker attachment to all nodes of connection and collectivity. And uh, by a node, I, I mean the, the most proximate being family, Friends, neighborhood, institutions, community, Israel, Jewish people. There are, these are not, exact, not exactly parallel, and, and some of these are in people's minds, not in their actions, and some of them are in their actions, but not in their minds, and, and some of them are in their interactions. But, uh, but however, we, however we, we measure these things, all of these nodes of Jewish connection and, and, and uh, collectivity are in decline. And it's the borderland Jews who are the least attached on any any of those any of those levels. And the, and the other implication of this borderland phenomenon is that because they move in and out, um, they produce Jews. If they, if they produce Jews, they also produce more borderland Jews. They're, they're growing. <coughs> they're growing in number. Um, so that's the reality. What what are the policy objectives? Uh, um, I <coughs> I think. Collectively and not individually. My, my, my personal and Jewish hero has always been David Ben-Gurion, <coughs> who, who thought about um, the importance of founding a state and the state and the nature of the state that he wanted to, to, to found. He was, he was not all that concerned with individuals. Um, the way I think is in terms of the, the is, let's call it the, 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 kind of the, the, the public health dimensions of the Jewish collectivity. And so from that point of view, um, I, I, I'm suggesting that there, are, there seems to be some policy ch challenges and opportunities here. And one is to operate on an individual level is to engage and integrate the borderland Jews. So given that there are so many of them, the, popu the population needs to respond to figure out, well, how can, they be, how can they become part of us? How can we keep them? How do we attract them? And secondly, once they're there, to elevate their commitment to Jewish life, because I, I'm telling you that once, the, even if they identify as Jews, they, they, they do, um, they, they score low on all these measures uh, of Jewish engagement, especially, um, especially uh, uh, ethnic uh, attachments in, in, in Israel. Um, but at the same time that we bring these people in, we have, we have a, a, 
we have the, the, the potential, depends on what you value, of, of uh, what I would say, decollectivizing Jewish life and Judaism. In other words, being Jewish is not an, an analogy to being Methodist or Lutheran. It is not a religion. It is a, um, it, it is a, an ethnic religious combination, ethno-religious that, that, that has strong national and ethnic elements as well as what Protestants would call religious elements. Um, the borderland Jews bring a, uh, a, a, a strictly or a heavily religious conception of what it means to be Jewish, and in appealing to them, we may, um, uh, uh, directly or inadvertently, uh, de says decollectivize, denationalize Judaism in, uh, in the United States, which I would regard, uh, from my value perspective, as deeply problematic. Um, the last potential or challenge is to use the encounter with borderland Jews and the different Jewish life that they represent to say, how do we create different forms of collectivity that actually can appeal to them and to a world which is, in fact, more fluid, malleable, hybrid, and, and, um, and so forth. And by that I mean that when it comes to social policy, we have not, not just two choices, but three. Normally, when we think of a challenge, we think either we have two choices, give in or fight back. Right? So um, give in, it's, 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 uh, uh, let's just do it their way and you know, give them the Judaism that they might like and uh, whatever it is, it is, and let's see if we can get them. Other possibility is, no, 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 hang tough, keep your principles, uh, if you lose them, you lose them, but you know, you can't, you, you, you gotta choose, right? Um, I wanna suggest that there's, that we need to keep looking for, as, we, as indeed we have over history, a third option. Um, one that is uh, market relevant and uh, mission loyal, and um, it's, it's, uh, there, there could be a third way or third ways to construct Jewish community that can um, be appealing to people who do not want to live in a world of solid, uh, impermeable identities that are exclusive and monopolistic and so forth and so on, but they are willing to be parts of community and to think of themselves as part of a collectivity, provided we can think of collectivity in, in different ways. Um, so in sum, my last comment, um, uh, our response to the growing number of borderland Jews will affect not only who will be Jewish, but what will be Judaism. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, the opportunity for some questions. We have microphones set up on both sides. So if possible, if people who have questions could head over to those mics and we'll have a chance to answer a few of them. And um, uh, borderland Jew or regular Jew, everybody probably uh, wants to go afterwards and have some of the reception. So everybody uh, likes food. So please join us afterwards for the reception in the Walker Ames um, room right across the hall. And one final thing, for those who enjoyed uh, tonight, uh, there's another lecture on Wednesday evening, which I think will be equally stimulating and hopefully humorous as well. So hope to see you on Wednesday night. Thank you. And that, that lecture is about Israel, and then uh, it will be in English, it will really be in English, <laughs> with a consecutive interpretation, which will be silent. Um, um, this gentleman over here. Yeah, I have a short one. Okay, what, in question? These mixed marriages, yes. there's, in these mixed marriages, there's offsprings. Okay, I concern is, what is the, the nature of the of uh, the religion of those offsprings. In other words, do we lose two or do we gain two? Good question. And what is the percentage of that in, within those groups? Right. Um, the, 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 the demographic background to that question is that we would be demographically neutral if only half of the children of intermarriages were to identify as Jews. The, the reason is that when 
one, when a Jew marries a non-Jew, you only use up one Jew. But when a, a Jew marries a Jew, you use up two Jews. So, so we just need half of the litters of the, of the intermarried to be Jewish litters to break even. Those, if you're, if, if you're a, a, an affirming Jew with a Jewish grandparent, like it, does, it, it may not help you to know that, well, your children, your grandchildren are not Jewish, but his grandchildren are Jewish, so the population breaks even. I, I know it doesn't help you, but I'm, from the population point of view, it doesn't really matter. Having said that, it turns out that we're not getting half. We're getting around a quarter to a third who identify as Jews, and this quarter to a third who grow up to be Jewish actually have very high rates of intermarriage themselves, and they also have low rates of Jewish involvement. So, um, um, so um, on, when it comes to intermarriage, I'm, I, I term myself an empirical hawk and a policy dove, which means that em empirically I, I, have, I have really tried to project to the world that let's not sugarcoat this thing, this is not great for the population. From a policy point of view, let's talk about all kinds of ways in which we can en engage these people. Um, and I, I, I can't, I, I understand, but I, I really can't agree with those who would, um, who, who are hawk hawk or dove doves. Either they say, it's a terrible problem, and therefore we should exclude them, or it's not a problem, and therefore we should include them. To me, the, both, both of those positions make no sense. Obviously, if, if I did, I, I think they're wrong, and I think I'm right. But that's, but that's, what, uh, that's what we're saying. There, there's a, there's a, a question over here from somebody, right? I, I can't yeah. see the, because of the light. Yeah. Thank you. Can you say a bit more, and I think you just sort of started to, about the third way, about some examples, you've seen some really successful examples of how rabbis, Jewish communal leaders are exemplifying that third way. Well, the, 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 the elements will have to come from um, attending to individual motivation and meaning building. In other words, we can't uh, rely on the effectiveness of articulating um, inherited principles of belonging in order to ensure belonging. We, we're going to have, and we're, people are doing this. We're creating communities and culture which attract people and, and in the process create, uh, organically create, uh, create norms to which people buy into. I, I'll give you, I, I want to speak, I'll, I'll clarify this by speaking about a, a friend of mine who's an Orthodox rabbi. And I remember at, we're, we're having breakfast one day. We, we, we see each other every six weeks or so. And I said to him, Dan, how, how do you put up with me? Like, how do you, like, you know, I'm not Orthodox. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kosher and like, you know, the whole list. Said, because my, 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 my generation's notion of orthodoxy is that orthodox people think I'm orthodox, and I, it's really my job to make you orthodox. And I wanted to hear what he had to say. And he said, that's not, he said, orthodoxy is my choice for the way I want to be. You have chosen the way you want to be, and they're both equally valid ways of being Jewish. I said, I, I, I knew there was an answer like that. I just needed to hear it. Um, and, and I think that, that that little exchange typifies what I'm, what I'm trying to get at, that there are, there are ways of creating normative systems and allegiance which are different from the ways we've done it in the past, and that, uh, and that respect and accept a strong dollop of personal autonomy. And, and, and personal meaning making. That's the world that, that we're in. So we're gonna have to work with that. We're gonna have to work with that world. And I'm saying let's do it, but let's not, let's not give up on some of our most cherished uh, princi uh, principles. If you say, well, you, you don't like that. You, you don't want a world in which, in which we don't you know, see loyalty and affiliation as a given. I'm saying, well, you don't have a choice. You, you, you can't, we, we, we can't go back and get that world that was a world in which we were, in a sense, all kind of 
children of ethnic immigrants, and we were excluded by the non-Jewish society, we were threatened, and so forth and so on, and therefore we, you know, we had no place to go, and we created a Jewish community. That was the world in which, which I grew up as a child in Brooklyn. Uh, um, it's not the world that exists right now, and therefore we have to make adjustments. And I think my, my talk about the borderland Jews puts the adjustments in, in sharp relief and says, look, look at them. If you can, we, we can create a community that appeals to these people who are sometimes Jewish, who could be Christian and Jewish, who move in and out of being Jewish, who are Jewish and something else. If, you, if, if we, can, we can attract those people, we can also attract people whose commitments are, in fact, more conventional. That's why I'm, 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 I'm talking about this. Uh, I guess you're next. No, on the other side? I'm sorry, I can't say. In my neighborhood, um, there's a religious organization that calls themselves Bet Tikva, House of Hope. Their rabbi is the son of Holocaust survivors, and it turns out they're a messianic church. Uh, they, they do their services in Hebrew. Uh, they're very pro-Israel, pro-Jewish. They need to have a police car in their parking lot during services because they get threats all the time. Uh, but they call themselves messianics. Are they Jews or are they not Jews? Um, my, my federation committee asked the same question. Um, I, I, as a sociologist, I favored calling them Jewish, but I, I, I would ask, partially I would ask you the question, my, the committee in which I worked for in doing a population study said, no, they're not Jewish. My colleagues said they weren't Jewish, so I, I lost that fight. Um, the, I, would, I, would make, I would make the judgment on the, on the basis of two questions. One, do, do they think that they're Jewish? I, I think the answer, by the way, is yes. And the second thing is, do... Do Jews generally think that they're Jewish? I think, I don't know about this crowd, I think that most Jews accept, would accept them as Jewish, and therefore I would say they're Jewish. If I, and I don't have the only evidence, but if I learned that most Jews, or certainly in a certain community, would not regard them as Jewish, then I would say, no, they're, they're excluded by the group from, from being Jewish. So it's really, I, I yield to the collective wisdom or insanity of the Jewish population. And, uh, but I believe if they're not Jewish to now, they'll be Jewish in 15 or 20 years. That's my, that's my sense. Yeah. Uh, um, I have a very simple question. Um, how does the emergence of these borderland Jews affect the relationship to this, reflect the state of Israel? And how does the emergence of the state of Israel relate to the emergence of the borderland Jews? I, I thank you for asking the question because I think what, I, what I've been trying to say is that there's such except on the kind of the, 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 the most rarefied of policy levels, um, th these are two ships that don't even touch in the night. It was like, Israel is among the least of the concerns of the borderland Jews. I, 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 I asked the question, I can tell you, you know, the, the percentages who care about Israel or have been to Israel, and they never go to Israel, and Israel doesn't touch, deal with them, and if there's, like I said, in the rarefied policy area, um, if, if someone, uh, if a conservative reform rabbi would want to convert them or represent them, so forth and so on, so there'll be a, there'll be a conflict over one of these people. But that's, that's about it. And because I'm, I am a Zionist and I am an Israeli and I care about these things, I'm worried about the shrinkage of the population that can be regarded as Israel engaged. And this... These people in particular and the trends that they represent uh, point to a diminishing of the uh, available population to be activated and mobilized on behalf of Israel. So to me, to me it's a, a deep, deep concern for that reason. I hope I, hope I answer your question. Let's take one more. Take one more. <laughs> Down there? Okay. As you talked about the shifting of identities and identification, you... You suggested having this third way. I'm curious who you think will be coming up with the third way and what's the shifting in terms of um, the power of who's actually putting things on the ground, setting policy, decision making. It's not clear to me that the power is actually going to come through decision making. Maybe it comes through money. Maybe it comes through, I don't know, some sort of other social networking. But how, how does this new third way emerge in terms of what's sort of, and where's that power shift and who, who's going to be able to help make that happen? Where do you see that happening? Well, I mean, aside from Noam's wife? Yes. <laughs> um, look, <coughs> that's... 
Um, Rabbi Rachel Nussbaum didn't ask me to come and speak here today, but I'll, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow and I'll tell you what I said. Um, but, but it's activities like that that are important um, laboratories of social change that we can look at and, um, and that can experiment with new, new uh, configurations, new, new ethos. Um, uh, but it also, the, the truth is that it rests within us, even if you're not a, you know, a partner in Kavanah. Um, if you're involved in some other aspect of Jewish life, you, it means perking up your ears if you're in, insofar as you're in policy position. And if someone is saying we should try something different or we should, we should you know, break a few rules or whatever, your reaction, ha I, I would hope, after this talk would be, oh, you know, I heard this talk. It's not my cup of tea, but let's try it. I mean, it's, it's that, you know, look, obviously you don't do, do things that are really antithetical to what you believe in. But we, we need to have a, a much greater openness to experimentation with different kinds of Jews and different ways of being Jewish and different ways of being hospitable and, and, uh, and organizing. Um, and it's not our incl inclination. I mean, I'm, personally, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't want to do any of these things that I want to see invented. But I want someone else <laughs> to invent those things. And I want say, to say to them, and, is a technical sociological term, gesundheit. You know, you, you should you should be healthy and do those things because the Jewish people need you to do those things. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realize I needed to have a non-disclosure uh, form. <laughs>